15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Space Nuts podcast. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me as always, Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing? I am doing quite well. Uh, coronavirus free in my district at the moment, but um, I'm sure that will change the way this thing's running around the planet as fast as, um, yeah. oh, I don't know, um, <laughs> As fast as the International Space Station, there you as go. As fast as Usain Bolt. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, uh, despite the fact that we don't have any sign of it here at the moment, we're taking all those precautions that are being recommended. So uh, all, all our sporting events are being put on the back burner and festivals. We had a couple of big music festivals that were about to kick off, so they've been canned. And I'm sure that's um, just going to be life as we know it for a little while. But they've got to slow this thing down is the way I understand it so that it doesn't overwhelm the health system. They're not going to stop it. They've just got to slow it down. That's the logic behind it all as far as I understand. So, um, yes. Um, uh, very disruptive to um, normality, but um, a little bit of disruption is better than a uh, an avalanche of health problems. Would be my assessment, I guess. Yeah, we've had um, major disruption um, because of cancelled overseas travel. Oh, and, yeah. uh, that's a big part of uh, our lives here. Uh, a lot of um, gigs that uh, you know, like astronomy festivals and things like that. Mm. Have, cancelled so uh it, it, but yes you know you can certainly put up with that in the interests of coming out of this the other side uh reasonably in reasonably good shape so yeah, i think well, everybody's everybody seems to be uh taking it very stoically yes so far um except for those yeah. who need toilet paper exactly <laughs> i was just about to say the same thing andrew and um, i still don't understand that but I, never mind i think it's just a knee-jerk reaction to something someone said i heard a rumor that it was actually something that started as a prank and has just gone berserk which is yeah. would not surprise me in the slightest uh, we, we had a trip um or have a trip scheduled for june but uh, it's starting to look less and less likely and portions of that trip have already been uh, wiped out so yeah. we, we're yeah. going to have to probably reschedule that as well yeah. it just means we, we've just got to stick on and keep doing space nuts That's, absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. And, and people need to download a lot of ebooks i, I yeah. know where you can get a few yeah <laughs> some really good ones yes it's really bad ones too. Uh, now, today on Space Nuts, Fred, we're going to be talking about uh, a planet that has a very strange cyclical system, and it's got nothing to do with water. In fact, uh, the the water cycle on this planet is um, something metallic, which is fascinating. Uh, and, and this one really um, interests me, an, an ancient fossil from the Cretaceous period that has uh, revealed that our days used to be much shorter quite a bit shorter in the scheme of things. So uh, that's that's rather fascinating. And we've got some audience questions, um, someone asking a follow-up question to our space-time topic and someone else talking about looking back in time, which we literally do every time we look out beyond our planet. So we'll, uh, we'll tackle all of those uh, issues today. We'll start off with WASP. 96b, Fred, this um, this planet that's got a, a bit of a strange not water cycle. Yeah, that's right. I I, I make it wasp 76b actually, but, what? but what did I say? Who's counting? Did I say Never seven? Mind. I, well, I thought I said seven six. That's what's written in front of me, but my brain turns things upside down sometimes. <laughs> when you play it back, you'll find out what you said. Okay. <laughs> no, it's all right. You said nine six B, but don't worry, it's okay. You just added two, which is very nice. I added, added twenty actually, so I can't read and you can't add up. That's what. That's what. <laughs> well, I could have told you that, <laughs> as, as most members of my family. Let's see if we can get. Um, let's see if we can get this number right it's mm. apparently 391 light years away <laughs> i'll take your word for it um actually that the, uh, i will do a calculation in my head because uh we astronomers don't really use light years in our professional work we use uh something called parsecs uh which is a, a quantity you can measure you can't actually measure a light year but i think it's uh three point is it three point two three or thereabouts 
uh, uh, light years to a parsec. So what this means is that this planet at 391 light years away is just over 100 parsecs away. And that, uh-huh. that's, you know, on our doorstep, really. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's not what we're really talking about, though. This is uh, WASP-76b, discovered by... Uh, a, a, a planet search program. It's ground-based rather than space-based like Kepler and TESS. But WASP, I think it's Wide Angle Search for Planets or something like that. It's a, uh, it's a, an installation that has small telescopes on many locations on Earth. Um, so this planet was discovered some time ago. But what's happened now is uh, astronomers uh, using a, a very, very fancy machine at the Very Large Telescope in Chile, the European Southern Observatories facility that we here in Australia now have access to, thanks to our government strategic partnership with with ESO. Um, the, those telescopes, four of them constituting the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, each one an 8.2 metre mirror. Um, on one of them now is an instrument with the very fine name of Espresso. Oh, very uh, good. It's a nice one, yeah. Espresso, though, is an acronym, and it's a slightly tortured one. It stands for Echelle Spectrograph for Rocky Exoplanet and Stable Spectroscopic Observations. It sounds like they came up with the acronym first and then said, let's figure some words out that'll fit. <laughs> I think all acronyms start <laughs> like that, actually. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's right. It does sound like that, yeah. Um, and it's uh, one of the, um, uh, you know, the, the group of uh, the team of astronomers who is... Uh, actually uh, doing this work uh, based in Switzerland at the Observatoire de Genève. Uh, he has, uh, he and his team have used Espresso uh, to Stay measure... Awake. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I think there's another one that they used. Uh, that's not quite sure which one that is. But anyway, Espresso was the, was the, was the principal one. Um, the uh, the uh, measurements made of WASP-76b allowed the astronomers to look at the some of the elements, the atomic elements, in the atmosphere of this planet. So it, I, we suspect it's, uh, it's, it's probably bigger than a, than a rocky planet. I'm, I, I'm not actually sure what its size is, but uh, it's, a, it's kind of a, a large Earth-like planet, I think is probably the best way to, uh, to describe it. But um, it has the extraordinary, um, <laughs> well, the extraordinary feature uh, that there is iron vapour in its atmosphere, uh, which is being, which you can measure, you know, using Espresso, the, the instrument. And it turns out that it looks as though um, this planet has a very hot day side and a very cold night side. And it's those, the, the, the temperature difference uh, that suggests that you, what you get is, uh, as you hinted at the beginning, you get rain showers of iron, molten iron coming down. Wow. Um, it must so, be, that, that's damn hot. It is. Well, it, that's right. So the, the, the star, its parent star, is only 5 million kilometres away from WASP-76b. Remember, we are 150 million kilometres yeah. from, from the sun. That would 5 do million kilometres. So it whizzes round once every 1.8 days. That's its year. Uh, and, the, you know, it's so close that its day side temperature is round about 3,000 degrees Celsius, and that's more than the actually more than the, the temperature at which iron vaporizes. It, it's not just molten; it's it's vapor at that temperature. Mm. But then um, it, this, the measurements that were made um, by this group of astronomers show that the night side of WASP 76b is about a thousand degrees cooler. <laughs> so there's a big Gee. temperature difference between them. It's and, still and, very, very hot in the scheme yes, of things. That, I mean, that's right. It's still two thousand degrees. You'd but want the aircon up pretty high. <laughs> you would. Um, but it means that you the the iron would be, be liquid well it would condense into clouds probably. Iron clouds. And uh, you might get a rain of iron from that, um, which is an astonishing, uh, you know, it's an astonishing scenario. We do know that it's possible that this happens with these failed stars known as brown dwarf stars. 
Ah. Um, which um, uh, th there is a suggestion that you get iron rain from those as well because they've got atmospheres. They're so cool that they're, they're actually similar temperatures to this planet. This is a planet which is being heated by its parent star, but a, a, a brown dwarf is a star which doesn't have the normal nuclear reactions going on in its interior. It's got something called deuterium burning, which gives you a, a lower level of, of uh, heat coming from the star. Mm. It puts its temperature in a similar region to what we've got here with, um, with WASP 76b. And there is, there is certainly a, a, the idea that you might get iron rain in brown dwarfs. But I think this is probably the first time astronomers have established that you could get iron rain on a planet uh, and it's just because of that extraordinary heat on the day side and contrasting with that uh, frigid 2,000 degrees Celsius on the on the night side where you get iron rain. It may even fall as iron snow. How about that? that That's be amazing. Cool. Does this suggest that there might be iron rivers and iron lakes? Um, well, yes, it, because the um, uh, if, if you've got, you know, a, a, an ambient temperature on the on the night side, uh, that is enough that that's warm enough for iron to exist a, as a liquid. You could get uh, iron, liquid iron flowing on the surface. The only thing is, when you get to the day side, as the planet turns, uh, and it, it may actually not turn. It may be um, at this distance. I suspect it might well be tidally locked. So yeah. one side is always facing the. The, the star and the other side's always facing away from it. Um, then that means that on the night side, you, you might well get pools of, of molten iron. Mm. Uh, otherwise, if it was turning, what would happen would be the, the, the iron would just evaporate during the day because the temperature's so hot. That's amazing, very, yeah. Very weird stuff, very Ter weird. Terrible place to go, not only because of the temperature, but we all hate ironing. Uh, <laughs> actually, um, I, I might be an exception to that rule. Um, I, I find ironing quite therapeutic. I do too, but don't tell my wife. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. I mean, no, me neither. I, I say to her, I'll, I'll iron my shirts, and she'll say no. And I'll say, why? Because I'll have to do them again. Again, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, she doesn't know that that's on purpose, but, you know, I've gotten away well, with that one for. 30 odd years. Yeah, she might listen to this though, Andrew. You've got to be careful what you say. <laughs> That's very, very true. Okay, mm. so this is a fascinating world. Uh, another question that sort of pops up in my mind is could this be a failed binary star system? Uh, that may be the case. I, I think, had that been. So, yes, yeah, so what you're suggesting is that this is not actually a planet, it's a brown dwarf. That's just a um, – yeah, it was a question, yeah. not a suggestion, but yeah, if, um, if, that, if that's possible, it's a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> um, my guess is that the uh, there would have been enough um, evidence of internal nuclear activity if – if the, the companion was a brown dwarf rather than a planet. I suspect the team has looked pretty closely at all this and they probably think of similar questions to what we do mm. uh, and ask them, uh, but they seem pretty keen on the idea that it's a planet. So it's a planet at this point in time, but uh, a fascinating one at that. Don't, I, I, I don't think it would be much fun being under iron rain. No, I think you're right. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it does sound a, a little bit on the hot side. You would literally become Iron Man. Might, yeah. Not not in a good way. No. Mm. Well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, uh, that is Wasp seventy six B. Thank you. Uh, we we've demoted it. Uh, yeah. you're, you're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Let's take a break from the show and hear a word or two from our sponsor, Grammarly. Now, I have to say I'm a big fan of Grammarly uh, because I've been using it for a few years now. Very helpful for authors, but uh, also really good for everyday life. They've saved me on a few occasions, uh, particularly with spelling, but also with a few issues that uh, didn't quite make sense. Uh, it's built by linguists and language lovers, and uh, Grammarly's writing app finds and corrects hundreds of complex writing errors so you don't have to do it yourself. Word by word, day by day. <laughs> you can uh, easily copy and paste any English text into Grammarly's online text editor or just install uh, Grammarly's free browser extension for Chrome, Safari, Firefox and quite a few others. Grammarly's algorithms flag potential issues in the text and suggest context-specific corrections for grammar, spelling and vocabulary 
Uh, Grammarly explains the reasoning behind each correction so you can make an informed decision about whether and how to correct an issue. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anything else you write on the web. Uh, for you, the listener of Space Nuts, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. So if you'd like to download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash space nuts. Again, that's getgrammarly.com slash space nuts to download Grammarly for free and let them know you came from us. Uh, I'll include the link in the show notes as well. And now... Back to Space Nuts. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Once again, Fred, I would like to send sincere thanks to our patrons. Um, we've got a few more. We're aiming for 500 patrons. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but uh, it's an opportunity for you to um, to put a little bit of um, uh, of money into the podcast voluntarily. It's not mandatory. We're not going to make you do it. We're not going to shut the door and say you can only listen if you pay. But if you feel obliged to, that is wonderful and we really appreciate it. And as a uh, patron, you get bonus material on our Patreon site, patreon.com slash space nuts. And you get a, uh, a commercial free early edition of the Space Nuts podcast as well. So um, there's uh, all sorts of good reasons to become a patron. And we're looking to build our numbers up steadily. So uh, and, and it's getting there. So uh, that is fantastic. So thank you su- uh, for supporting the Space Nuts podcast. It is certainly uh, greatly appreciated. Now, Fred, uh, this I love this story. A, um, I love the way it's written too. A chunk of rock that has been buried in ground for millions of years has become a new clock. Uh, this is an ancient fossil from the Cretaceous period that they're talking about, and it, uh, it's shown up um, one interesting aspect of, of the world from, you know, 70,000 or, or 70 million years ago, I should say. Here, there goes my mathematics again. Um, that the, uh, the days were much shorter than they are now. Uh, that's that's correct. Yeah, we we sort of knew that um, uh, theoretically because the um, you know the day length is increasing as we speak, which is why we have leap seconds occasionally. Yes, um, and a lot of that is uh, tied up with the interaction between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, the Moon, the fact that the Moon's drifting away is because it's taking energy from the Earth's rotation, uh, and that's slowing the rotation down. So we do know that process. Is ongoing, but this I, I absolutely agree with you, Andrew. It is a beautiful piece of work, is this, and it's uh, such a nice conclusion that's drawn. And yeah, I, I agree with you as well that it was very nicely written up. Um, and I might give a shout out to Michelle Starr of Science Alert, who actually um, wrote, wrote this, uh, the, the, you know, wrote the article on this. It's very nicely done. So uh, what we got? Well, we've got a fossil of a, a shell, a bivalve shell. Um, I think these things were probably quite a lot bigger than the mollusks that we're used to today. I Um, I used to have one as a pet, Fred. (laughs) A a pet bivalve? Yes, in my fish tank. In your fish tank. Mm. What was it called? Fred. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not joking. (laughs) There you go. What a prescient uh, name to give to your bivalve. (laughs) Yeah, he, he was great. He lived under the gravel and just, you know, cleaned up. Uh, it's all right. Yeah. I once had a cactus called Plug. <laughs> uh, um, it actually belonged to a friend of mine, and he bequeathed it to, to me. And Plug, Plug lived on the kitchen windowsill for many, many years. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's another story. Um, what's the story with the bivalve? They're, they're shaped, uh, you know, I, I guess a bit like, uh, as, as uh, Michelle Starr Star says in her article, they're shaped, shaped a bit like a vase. Um, with a or a vase if you're on the other side of the Pacific, um, but with uh, at the wider end they've got this lid, um, and they were they were basically on ancient reefs. Uh, th- this particular species, I'm going to attempt its name, uh, Toria Toriaites sanchezi. There that's, you are. That's pretty close. Yeah, I think because I, be I can read, and I'm pretty sure that's what it says. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> We're all losing our faculties at a great rate at the moment. <laughs> well, it's, it's nearly the end of the year, Fred. Uh, is that right? <laughs> Could be. Anyway, the Cretaceous tertiary, well, the Cretaceous uh, uh, paleogene uh, or paleogenic um, extinction. Uh, this is a, the, a time 
basically when the dinosaurs were wiped out. Uh, the, these, this particular species was also wiped out. Mm. Uh, so um, they're now extinct. They don't exist anymore. But they are of interest because we, we, you know, we have bivalves uh, in the modern era, uh, nothing, probably nothing quite as big as this. Uh, but um, the really interesting aspect of this bivalve uh, and it's, you know, this is common to the, the, the ones we see around us today. Um, they have a, a, a growth rate in their shells, which is one layer per day. Um, and ah. that, you know, that's the, that's the key to this research because it grows one layer per day, just like uh, essentially, um, you know, in the same way as tree rings put on a, a new ring every year. Yeah. Uh, but these things have one layer per day. So you can almost count the days when you, when you look at the age of them. Um, the, the key thing, though, is that they also respond to changes in the season. And so uh, the, 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 well, it, it, just taking an example from modern day bivalves, a, a modern clam, one of, the, one of those big clam shells. Yeah. Uh, in, in winter time, the layers that they put on are darker. And so um, with the same, it's, it's true of, of, of the San she, T. Sanseji fossil, uh, that it had color gradations in its, in its not tree rings, but in its its layers of growth. Mm. So not only do you have uh, a layer for each day, you've got a kind of marker for when the year changes, for the the, the seasonal changes, and that is the, the crucial the smoking uh, mollusk, smoking gun. That's right. So um, first of all, the the team that analysed this, uh, uh, the the team that did this work, uh, basically. Uh, they're actually, um, I think, the uh, one of the, the main uh, geochemists who's involved with this uh, is at a university in Brussels in Belgium, just to give them a shout as well as to where they are. But they they, assume, they use the, these these various layers to um, determine that this thing lived for an age of about nine years. Yeah which is good. So that means they've got nine years worth of information and they've got the daily layers packed into that. And the key thing is that they got the daily layers uh, fit into a year with not 365 of them, but 372. Ooh. So oh, they, that means there are 372 days in a year about 70 million years ago, which wow. is the is fossil. So how, how long was a day? It brings it down to about 23 and a half hours. Good So you, you lose, yeah, if you do the calculation, 365 to 372. So if, uh, you go, if you go further back, are they suggesting the days were even shorter and the years yeah. were many more? Yes, that, that, that's right. Um, so this is a really nice snapshot of what things were like 70 million years ago when this fossil was laid down. Um, and you, you can sort of extrapolate back uh, for the whole 4.6 billion years of the Earth's history. But you come to a, a time when um, it, it looks as though, the, you know, the day basically was, uh, was very, very short. Mm. Um, um, the, the, the best thinking on this, uh, which comes about from arguments to do with the the rotational energy of the Earth and Moon system suggests that the fastest the Earth ever rotated, and this was probably not long after the Moon was formed, was about once in four hours. Wow. Uh, so a day length of four hours. That's, now, when, it, that's when it uh, got hit by Thea. Well, that, that's right. It was probably after it was hit by Thea, yeah. because that's uh, sort of extrapolating back from where we are now. Um, the, it, this interests me as well from a historical point of view, because... Uh, there was a scientist by the name of George Darwin. I think you and I have talked about him before. He's got a very famous surname because he had a very famous father. Mm. Uh, George is the son of Charles. Charles uh, worked on the origin of species. George worked on the origin of the moon. <laughs> uh, he was an astronomer, actually, in Cambridge. And in the 1880s, I think it was, he developed this theory that very early in the, the Earth's history that the Earth had been spinning so fast that debris had spun off its equator, and that was what formed the moon. 
Um, but it's a good it turned, theory. It is a good theory, yeah. Uh, but the reason why it got knocked on the head is that to do that, if I remember rightly, the figures are that the, the Earth would have to turn once every two hours. And the evidence seems to be that it never turned that quickly. I'm not sure what that evidence is. I think it might be dynamical rather than geological. But the, the thinking is that the Earth could never have rotated quickly enough for that happen, to happen. And and uh, that's why we now have the the Thea impact theory, as you just mentioned. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but that, that that's not really anything to do with this work. But <clears throat> excuse me, this this uh, this bivalve study though is really giving you a very nice pointer, um, a st just a, a little um, measurement of one uh, one period in in the Earth's history uh, when we can see without any question at all that the day was shorter and actually measure that. And I think that's an astonishing thing to be able to do. There was nobody around with a clock uh, 70 million years ago when this thing was uh, living on its reef. No, indeed. And uh, I suppose over the course of time, the rotation slowed, the days have become longer. Uh, and so here we are. Here we are. But the other thing, of course, is that the moon has drifted away. The moon would have been much, much closer uh, in the early history of the Earth moon system. Mm. And, um, you know, um, probably um, it's one of the calculations. I'm, not, I'm sure it's been done, but I haven't looked at it. Uh, you could work out how far away the moon was uh, 70 million years ago when this this uh, bivalve was alive. So if you uh, were to study a bivalve today, you'd find 365 oh, oh, oh. rings per year. That is what you'd expect, exactly. Give because you get a daily, a daily lay, laying down of a ring or a, you know, a, yeah. a layer of, of, the, of the shell. They're very handy little creatures, aren't they? Yeah, it's remarkable. It's just a remarkable piece of work, and uh, I think I love that stuff. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I do too. That's a great story. Yeah. All right. Um, and they're great pets. They don't argue. They feed themselves. They keep the place clean. I mean, they're just like one of those robotic vacuum cleaners. Yes, <laughs> unlike unlike plug the cactus, which did nothing uh, except store water for itself. <laughs> yes, that's right, <laughs> yeah. and got uh, and got dusty. I, I'm sorry to say that uh, Fred did pass away after a, a couple of years. He um, yeah. he was quite elderly when I got him. Um, okay. Yes. Familiar? No. Yes. Okay. Sounds, sounds, sounds like a, a nice little parable there. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, you're listening to Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley with. Fred Watson, the not bivalve. Bivalve. <laughs> Space nuts. Also, uh, Fred, just um, thanks to our social media people, uh, the people who follow us on YouTube, the people that follow us on uh, Facebook, uh, the Space Nuts podcast group that uh, basically talks amongst themselves on Facebook. They're, they're terrific. It's a great community. Uh, get a lot of positive feedback about it. And if you would like to join the Space Nuts podcast group or follow us on Facebook, by all means do. You might also like to subscribe on YouTube and get our numbers up there. We're well past the 1,000 now, 1,140-odd. 1, uh, that is 1,140-odd people. Um, but we appreciate them all. Uh, and I've got a really great one here, Fred. Um, I've, I've received a message from... A a uh, fellow Christopher in uh, in Geelong in Victoria uh, he said he just listened to episode 192 please don't stop uh, producing this podcast gentlemen also you mentioned someone requesting the link to the Space Nuts shop and how they bought a t-shirt well that was me and it arrived today keep up the good work and there he is can you see that <laughs> oh yeah great good posing stuff. with his t-shirt so <laughs> and I'm pleased to say I got a message from Hugh we have polo shirts Oh really? Okay, yes. I'll I'll start getting interested in that then. They're not on they're not on the um, uh, on the shop yet, but uh, we will have them up there very very soon. We've just got to do a redesign on the logo because we need a clear background. But uh, we th it's just that much closer to getting Good. polo shirts and other bits Good. and bobs. So that's fantastic. Now let's get into some questions, and this one comes from Russ at Stourbridge in the UK. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Hi, Andrew. You discussed frame dragging in the latest episode. Hypothetically, if a very large mass, say a neutron star, were to suddenly disappear, just vanish, would space-time return to its normal state 
uh, or returning to its normal state, release energy? If so, how much? Enough to create an explosion? Uh, I suppose I'm asking if there is potential energy stored in the distortion of space-time caused by frame-dragging. Interesting. That's a great, a great question, Ross. And um, I think the answer is yes. I, the thing is that, um, you know, OK, you've got a neutron star, it's spinning, it's frame dragging, and then it disappears. Now, that in itself uh, is a tricky situation. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> so um, who knows what might be the effect of that, this thing disappearing. But I think Russ's conjecture is correct, that you would get, um, you know, the, the frame dragging is is a, an elastic phenomenon because space itself is elastic. That's mm. the whole point of general relativity. And so um, presumably it would return to its rest state. And my guess is that it would indeed release energy. Uh, I've no idea how much or what form that might take. Um, I, uh, Ross asks whether it would be enough to create an explosion. Um, I suspect uh, if it did, it would be nothing compared with the aftermath of the explosion caused by the disappearing neutron star. Indeed. Because uh, yes. that, you know, that, that in itself is, is a fairly hefty thing. But I think Ross's uh, final sentence is really on the money. He says, I suppose I'm asking if there's potential energy stored in the distortion of space-time caused by frame dragging. And I think the answer to that is yes, there is. Okay. Wow. All right, there you go. Russ, you're right on the money. Oh, it didn't even cross my mind uh, the, uh, about energy storage in that um, kind of phenomenon. But uh, given that space and space-time are, are so liquid, um, anything <coughs> moving is, um, is, is, is an energy source, expending energy, creating energy. Energy just moves around in space just like everything else, I suppose. That's, that's, yeah, that sums it up very well. Mm. Oh, that was a guess. Anyway, <laughs> uh, good. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, for the question, Russ. Uh, let's move on to our next question from Gavin uh, in Yass in New South Wales, and uh, I'm guessing the answer to this question might be yes. No. Uh -oh. um, uh, good day to Andrew and Dr. Fred Watson. Um, He's asked a question before, which I think was, we put in the too hard basket, but we'll have to chase that up. We should uh, chase it up, yeah. Now, he says, we, we keep hearing that we look back in time when we look at the sky. Also, we can see so far back, uh, we can see the first galaxies being formed. If that is so, can we see back and uh, look at the Milky Way being formed. I know it wouldn't have a, a sign on it to tell us uh, the difference from others. Just a thought to keep uh, the 73-year-old brain going. To take it further, could we look back 6 billion years and see a 7 billion-year-old Milky Way? Uh, I don't believe so, as the light should already be past Earth. Thanks in advance, Gavin in Yass. Gavin, it's a great question, and you're you're right that looking out in space is equivalent to looking back in time. But uh, there are certain limitations on that. So, um, and it's all about distance. It's the fact that time and distance become the same thing when you're looking into space. You, um, and that's simply because the the light from galaxies or whatever they are take or even stars and actually even the sun and moon, uh, the light takes a finite time to reach us. The, 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 the uh, moonlight comes to us in about 1.3 seconds, sunlight in about eight minutes. Um, the light from the nearest big galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy takes about uh, 20, sorry, 2 uh, million years to get to us. So um, the key thing is that in order to see something as it was at an earlier time, it has to be a long way away. Yeah. Um, so, you you know, that's why we can look at really, really distant galaxies measured in tens uh, or, or measured in certainly in billions of light years and uh, 10, 11, 12 billion light years. These are galaxies that are among the first generation of galaxies to form in the universe. We, we're looking at very, very distant objects, very faint, a long way off. Uh, which is why we need things like the Hubble telescope to do that. Mm. But um, the, it's only because they are so far away that we can see them uh, as they were at that early time. Now, the, the issue with the Milky Way is that we're in it. We're actually part of it. And so we can only see it as it is effectively now. 
I mean, when we look at the when we look at the, br- the the bright stars around us, the naked eye stars that we can see just by going out on a starry night, especially uh, one where you don't have light pollution, uh, those stars are within a thousand light years, most of them. So they're you know they're, they're close. They're, we're we're seeing them. Uh, at, at a time in the past, which is not that much different from today, um, with with our the centre of our galaxy, um, and we see this in the constellation of Sagittarius, which will be beautifully visible from Yass. Yass has probably got reasonably dark skies located where it is, um, north of Canberra. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the 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 constellation of Sagittarius sits in the in the bulge of the of our galaxy. That's the sort of central hub of our galaxy. It's about 25,000 light years away. So you're looking back in time about 25,000 years. But, um, you know, none of the, the, the galaxy that we can see um, is far enough away that we see it appreciably back in time. We don't see it evolving mm. just because we're part of it. So it's time and distance that are related. And you can't just separate the time from the distance, which was really the, the nub of, uh, of Gavin's question. Yeah. Um, keep up the good work, Gavin, though. I know all about keeping ancient brains going <laughs> because I try and do that myself too. <laughs> that's, that's, of course, why we started the Space Nuts podcast to keep... Fred's brain going. <laughs> Is that what it was? That was yeah. I, th- I thought it was just spite on your part. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. Although, you know, um, Gavin raises that very interesting uh, situation where there are probably things that have happened in the universe that we will see on Earth but maybe not for a long, long time um, because, yeah. of the, because of the, the, the time that light takes to travel and the distances that things are away from us so we could um we could write uh, well you know several thousand years ago there could have been something that's happened that we haven't seen yet because it hasn't reached us in terms of the light that's traveling yes that's true exactly and and the converse is true as well you know there might be distant galaxies that had a, a an exp- an outburst from their supermassive black hole or something like that um but that particular galaxy, the, the light from its output, its outburst went past the Earth a thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. Yeah. So we've missed it. Um, the 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 reason why we can learn so much about the evolution of galaxies and see these, you know, occasional outbursts and the effect of outbursts um, is because there are so many galaxies mm. and they're all at different distances. So you've got a huge number to choose from and it's just finding the ones that show the phenomena that, uh, that, 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 that whatever that phenomenon is, it's actually its light is getting to us right now because of the distance of the galaxy. It, it, it's, it's because, you know, it is because we've got lots of galaxies to choose from that we can learn such a lot about them. Yeah, I, and I, I suppose when you see uh, multiple events that are similar, you know that that's a common thing. Yeah. Uh, but one wonders if there is some unique event that we've never witnessed before well, that may may or may not appear in our skies at some stage. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, what you're saying is right because um, w- the, there are very rare events um, which might not be quite as rare as you thought they were when you start building better telescopes. Mm. Um, and what I'm thinking of is fast radio bursts. That they're yeah. exactly what yeah. you've suggested. Gra- gravitational yeah, waves. Yeah, and gra- we've we've only just got the technology to see these phenomena, and um, and now we've got that technology, we see that they're relatively common throughout the universe. So, new phenomena are what astronomers are always on the lookout for. And um, yes, I mean, I- why why stop at all the stuff we can't explain now? Let's find more that we can't explain. <laughs> Let's just do that. <laughs> The great thing is that when when you do explain it, there's a Nobel Prize at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. I can see yours on the mantelpiece behind you. That's nice. Uh, I, I wish. I wish. <laughs> there's still plenty of time for it. Yeah. <laughs> In the vast distances of space. Yes. Um, thank you, Fred. Oh, uh, thank you um, uh, for the question too. Uh, much appreciated because it um, it sort of lifted the lid on some interesting thinking, Gavin. So uh, much appreciated, uh, and thank you. Uh, everybody for listening. Uh, don't forget the Space Nuts shop, bytes.com slash Space Nuts. That's B-I-T-E-S-Z. Uh, we're adding more and more to that. Um, 
occasionally. But, uh, yeah, uh, everything you need is uh, on that site, uh, including a way to get in touch with us. If you scroll down, and we've put it right down the bottom where nobody goes, uh, you can send us messages. So um, there you go. Uh, thank you, Fred, as always. Uh, terrific fun and a really good program this week. There were some insightful questions, <laughs> as always. Not- not to mention the bivalve, Fred. Yeah, he was, he was my best mate. <laughs> I think that says quite a lot about you, Andrew, as well. <laughs> he always listened. Actually, no, sometimes I'd look at him and say something and he'd bury himself in the sand. Oh, OK. <laughs> Good to talk to you, Andrew. Um, Mandu's just wandered in. Uh, he's just complaining about something, so I'd better prob- go and see what Probably he wants. the lack of food. That's probably yes, what it is. Or so the lack of story. <laughs> the lack of toilet paper. That would be upsetting like too. too yeah. <laughs> See you later. Thanks, Fred. See you later. Bye. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and he's part of the not so dynamic duo that makes up Space Nuts, um, including me. Thank you for your company. We'll catch you again next week on another episode. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.